because some supposed improvement is going to happen that no one can show any evidence for. It's, it's a religion. It's a cult, if you will, because you just believe in it on faith. Electric vehicles are a non-starter. They are a no-go. They are not the future. There are several reasons why. But the reason that I'm going to address today, the major reason, the annoying fallacy that always comes up in these discussions that has nothing to do with gasoline efficiency or where the power comes from or how much any of the stuff costs is this ridiculous notion that in the future, somehow, magically, there will be improvements to the technology. There will be vast improvements in battery technology in particular in efficiency and all of this stuff and the improvements that will come in the future that you can't ignore because if, if you aren't mentioning the improvements that are definitely going to come then you're you're not informed and you don't understand what you're talking about when you criticize EVs those improvements they're going to make electric vehicles powered by magical rainbows that are extremely efficient by the way take over the entire automotive world it'll be a revolution and all you need to do is stop being a backwards Luddite that can't let go of their carbureted 1960s Mustang. I have bad news for you. You can't bank on future technological improvements. In fact, we already have a model that shows that this is a thing that you simply can't count on. That model is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an infamous computer technology thing that basically says computing power will basically grow exponentially. It'll just keep doubling year over year or five every five years or whatever. I don't remember the details. The bottom line is Moore's Law predicted exponential growth in computing power over time. We have gotten to the point where the lithography used to create computer chips is so fine, it's so tiny, that we are not quite at the individual atom level yet, but we're dealing in small clusters of atoms. The, the tiny amount of like nanometer size, it has grown so small that we are almost at atomic limits on where we can go with processor technology. So what that means is that there's no more shrinking. If I have a surface area this big, or this big, any size, we can only fit so many things into that surface area because at some point you run up upon individual atoms or as close as we can get to that. And we are basically on top of that at this point. Processors can no longer become faster by shrinking the process and putting more crap onto the die. It's gone. It's done. That will never happen again. We can't get better as far as the size of the stuff going there. So... What do we do? Well, you now see processors that build out instead of shrinking down. Instead of worrying so much about shrinking the manufacturing process to fit more crap into one square, now what we do is we build smarter, not smaller. We build processors with more cores. We build processors with cores that have different functionality. The most recent Intel generation has processors with efficiency cores and with performance cores, which is something cell phones have been doing for years in their so-called octa-core processors. They're really quad cores that have four efficient and four fast cores. And they switch between them as power demands and speed demands change. So We've got this in CPUs. We are at the limit with our processor technology. You will never see processors get massively faster. The era of huge growth in a single core's processing power is gone. It's all about parallelism now. It's all about making more stuff on that die that works better together. But that's the problem with the electric cars. That's the problem with the batteries. There's this assumption that somehow we're going to find some way to store even more energy in these batteries down the line. And I don't know. Maybe we will. Maybe there will be a breakthrough like lithium-ion technology was. Before lithium-ion, you had nickel-cadmium and nickel-metal hydride and lead-acid. 
that was it. Those were the big three rechargeable battery types. You used lead-acid batteries in cars, and then they still do use lead-acid in internal combustion engine cars because it's a really, really powerful battery. When you need to crank over an entire motor, that thing can do it, and it can do it in the cold. You're probably not going to get that from nickel cadmium. But, you know, NICADs had their problems. Nickel metal hydride had its problems. There are memory effects. There are losses of power over time, especially with metal hydride if you didn't drain it before charging it, it would lose some of its ability over time to hold that charge, and eventually they'd go poof. NICADs, they had a memory effect. If you didn't use them in different ways, they'd kind of crystallize inside, and you'd have problems. Plus, they couldn't push that many amps compared to nickel metal hydride. So, you see, NICADs kind of fell out of favor. Nickel metal hydride still used a lot in, uh, you know, drills and stuff, but even those have converted to lithium ion. Lithium battery technology has an amazing amount of storage capacity relative to previous batteries. But it's nothing compared to the energy... Wow, that was loud. There was no it's nothing compared to the energy density of a tank of gasoline. There's way more energy in gasoline. And even with the inefficiency of an auto cycle combustion engine burning gasoline... Just think about this for a second. Even with the low efficiency of a modern auto cycle engine, it's still getting more energy out of that gasoline faster than what you would get if you had a gigantic car battery. You can't bank on those battery improvements coming to catch it up to gasoline in terms of energy density. And even if you did, imagine how much battery you would still need. Like, let's say, for example, that you were able to double the energy density of a battery, okay? If you double the energy density of a lithium battery that's used in a car, it, it wouldn't necessarily be lithium anymore, but a battery used in an electric vehicle. Okay, now you can either have half the footprint, which means the same charge for smaller space, which means you can make smaller cars, which would make sense, or you can have the same footprint but have more range. You can have the car go further. You can have it last longer before between whatever charges. So even if you can just get that to double, the problem is there's no way to know that that's actually going to happen. There's no way that we can even get to that point. And even if you did, even if you doubled the battery's energy density, it's still nowhere near the density of gasoline and diesel and such. So the other problem, too, is charging. Unless they do something somehow to make this battery charge faster, which you can't necessarily do. It's a chemical process. In the end, batteries are chemical storage for electricity. And it's a chemical process, and it kind of goes through an exponential sort of fall off. No matter what battery chemistry you deal with, you get a lot more charge at the beginning, and then as it starts to fill up, you can't charge it as fast. The process happens less because there's less of it to process. So battery charging times can only improve so much. Battery energy density can only improve so much. But they need to improve by almost an order of magnitude just to catch up to gasoline and diesel. Plus, I don't want to sit down here and charge my car for an hour whenever it starts getting low on juice. I don't want to be stuck somewhere waiting for an hour to get my car charged back up to get another 200 miles or less out of it. I don't know, some Teslas can go pretty far, but a lot of cheaper EVs, you know, affordable, affordable EVs that cost two to, four, two to four times my Mitsubishi Mirage sticker price, they just can't do it. And I'm not gonna sit there for an hour. I'm gonna fill up my gas tank, note it in my phone, drive off with a full tank and 360 miles of range in about three or four minutes. So you do what you want. I can't tell you what's right for you, but I can tell you that when you bank on future technology magically getting better, you're wrong. You can't use that as an assertion in the argument whenever you try to support EVs. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. You don't have that technology yet. You don't know that that technology will ever come about. In fact, one of the reasons that hydrogen fuel cells are so interesting is that they store energy in a different way. And fuel cells in general, 
The problem is you can only store so much in a battery, so realistically, it makes more sense to find something other than a battery to store the energy in, because the density with the batteries isn't there. The lithium stuff? Oh yeah, it's improved. It's improved quite a bit. It's improved quite a bit in the past 20 years, but the truth of the matter is lithium batteries have been around for a long time now, 20, 30, 40 years, I don't even know anymore. But I know that lithium ion batteries have been the thing for decades. And yet, we only have somewhat relatively small improvements in energy density over two decades. I haven't seen that great of an improvement yet. You know, you can't power an old laptop using a modern cell phone battery. It hasn't gotten that good. It's just not there. And there's no way you can say that it's, oh, it's coming. It's totally coming, bro. It's going to happen. I promise it's going to happen. There's going to be improvements in technology. Just wait. See, and you can't, you can't factor in, you know, all this gas stuff. All the, You can't be like, gas is so much better without looking at all the things that haven't happened at all yet that you have no evidence will ever happen but, oh, they're totally coming. Promise. Yeah. So, you know, buy EVs now. EVs are the answer now because of the technology that will come later. But if I buy one now, I'm stuck with the stuff now. I'm not going to get that better technology later, even if it does come out. It's just a non-starter on so many levels. And I hate it. I hate it when these people argue that EVs are magically going to be able to do all the stuff gas engines do in the future because some supposed improvement is going to happen that no one can show any evidence for. It's, it's a religion. It's a cult, if you will. Because you just believe in it on faith. And you have absolutely nothing to back it other than, trust me, bro, some guy probably smarter than me said so. So even though he was also just sort of going, oh, well, I got a lot of money invested in this EV thing. I can't afford to have it collapse. So I'm just going to promise, you know, the world. And when it doesn't come, well, it's easier to, you know, get, ask for forgiveness than permission, so to speak. So, yeah. <sighs> Stop arguing that EVs are magically going to go through some technological transformation that's going to make them amazing because it's not going to to happen. And if it does happen, it's not going to make all the EVs that came before it any better. And if it does happen, and those EVs don't get any better, well, those people feel ripped off. They're going to have to spend more money on another EV with all those magical, fruity improvements. Now, aren't they? Or they're going to have to upgrade their existing one. Hey, more money for the car companies doesn't help the early adopters that buy in right now. Now, does it? So what are you going to do? The best thing you can do is go out and buy a gas engine vehicle that's not big and bulky. The problem is car makers are being forced into making electric vehicles due to the rising CAFE requirements, the fuel economy standards set by the federal government. By 2025, I think it is, fleet requirements for cars are like 54.5 miles per gallon, something like that. I, I believe that that's what I read is that it's, we're not far off from expecting more than 50 miles per gallon average across a fleet sold by car dealers. So they're going to be forced to make EVs due to stupid policy that is not necessarily possible to meet. The problem is small cars, small cars have been killed off by cafe requirements. Everything's become a light truck because of the lower standards. Then you have... The big cars, they're getting knocked off because if you have big cars, they make your car category's fuel thing go up. Electric cars, the battery makes the footprint bigger, so you have to have a big car if it's an electric car. You can't make a small EV because then there's not enough battery for the thing to go 60 miles. You can't make a compact or subcompact hatchback EV and expect it to go very far. That's just the nature of the batteries. and. Future technology is not going to change that. So what are you going to do? What we need to do is get the government out of it. We need the government's fuel economy standards to go the hell away and the car companies to be able to make small gasoline engine cars again. A whole bunch of little three-cylinder hatchbacks all over the place would be perfectly fine. There are plenty of people who would drive them if it weren't for the fact that everything is a big truck now. We're going in the wrong direction. Not everybody should be driving an F-350 with a camper shell that they call a crossover at this point. I mean, that's the problem. The SUV is the new small car.
because of the government. Get the government out of it. Stop subsidizing failing electric vehicles. Stop forcing automakers to make vehicles the size of a small planet with its own gravity and zip code to take you by yourself to your job and then take your fat kid that doesn't walk and becomes me to McDonald's half a mile away. They need to ride their bikes. They're too fat anyway. If you excuse me, i got to go get on my bike and stop ranting. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and have a wonderful day. Take care.